Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, Keith Burns with Green Cover here. It's, uh, it's, it's exciting to kick off another webinar series. You know, when we talk about the principles of soil health, a lot of times the one that people struggle with the most, including ourselves, is how do you properly integrate livestock into the operation? Certainly more challenging for some than others, uh, depending on infrastructure and any manner of things. But as if it wasn't challenging enough to just integrate regular livestock, we've got a guy here with us today that said, doing cattle are easy. I'm going to do weird things like water buffalo and yak and all these other things that uh, uh, are just, just very, very unique. Uh, but, but there's a reason for it. So I want to introduce you to Michael Detweiler. Uh, we have known Michael now for a number of years. And Michael, how what, is that? Two, three years ago, we were at your place and we toured uh, toured through your paddocks and saw yep. the buffalo and just, just had a great time. Uh, and, and not just seeing the unique animals, but seeing the unique soil changes that are happening. So uh, Michael uh, is with uh, BYO Operations Beyond Organics in Koshkanong. Did I pronounce that right? Koshkanong. Yeah, that is Koshkanong, yes. Koshkanong, Missouri. There is not much in Koshkanong. So a Dollar you, General, a gas station, and 200 people. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a very big town, but it's right on the edge of the Arkansas border. So it's in the Ozark. So Michael is blessed with a lot of things. Good soil is not one of them. <laughs> they have to build their own soil. And yeah. so when he's going through this, remember the context of Southern Missouri, Ozarks, lots of rocks, wow. very thin soils. And so what he's doing and what he's going to show you is really pretty remarkable. And it's a great testament and a testimony to the power of the soil health principles. And not just the first ones, but the livestock integration as well. So I'm excited about what he's going to share. Uh, if you were at our Iola conference last uh, November, uh, Michael was part of our livestock panel there, and the information was so interesting that we really wanted to have him back on for a broader audience. So, uh, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you. Go ahead and share your screen, and then you can kind of introduce yourself and your operation and, and your own story of how you've kind of gotten to where you're at. All right. Perfect. Okay. See you. I'm, I'm actually... I'm actually going to go off screen uh, just so that when uh, uh, people are focusing on the slideshow here. Okay. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here with Keith and uh, Green Cover. Uh, I met Keith three years ago. He came to the ranch. I think it was two and a half years ago, Keith. And uh, I have been here for uh, two years, four years, excuse me, down here in the um, in the Ozarks. I was born and raised in central Illinois where um, the topsoil is actually present and the rocks are not. And it has been an education from the word go. Um, I took over management of the ranch. The, the ranch is owned by Jordan Rubin, who has made his claim to fame in the nutraceutical and supplement side of the equation. He's the founder of Garden of Life uh, Supplement Company. He sold that um, and in the in between, between selling Garden of Life and starting Ancient Nutrition, he bought uh, this ranch as well as another couple ranches and started a um, grass fed dairy in the Ozarks and sold milk products, raw milk, cheese, etc. And about five years ago, that disappeared, and I came in after kind of a transitional lull and. I have had an education every day since I've started here. Um, I, if my dad was still alive, I'd go back and apologize to him for grumbling about the one or two rocks we'd find occasionally in a post hole uh, up there, because here you just are thrilled to find any soil, but um, it's made its own unique changes. We're down here in the Ozark Plateau, about two hours directly south of Rollo. We get about 42 average inches of rain a year. Um, and when I moved here, I thought the people were kidding me that we're two days from a flood two weeks from a drought and they weren't kidding. Um, so it's been an interesting transition. Like I said, we started, th this will be our third, actually moving into our third year in the fall. Uh, we've, uh, Jordan launched uh, the ranch program, Regenerative Agriculture, Nutrition, and Climate Health. I know that's climate health, not climate change. Um, we're definitely firm believers of, you know, godly stewardship over the land. And we, 
the study has tweaked a little bit. We're in partnership with the Rodale Institute and Snaplands LLC um, Forge Consultants. They're on the team as well. And it's a seven year program using um, annual row crops to begin with, uh, annual cover crops, excuse me, into our existing pastures and an Allen Savory style managed, uh, managed rotational grazing pet, uh, program. And we're measuring about 35 different indicators on soil health, including everything from soil organic matter to PLFA tests, um, you know, the list goes on and on. So, um, and that's an ongoing study and it's exciting to see some changes. And we're, this is our third spring into that. And I think we're really seeing some, the changes are happening and happening a little quicker. So Keith talk, asked me to talk about integrating warm season annuals into dormant cool season pastures. Um, Killing the soil in the Ozarks is not advisable with the rocks. Um, and it is, <laughs> yeah, it's just not feasible. So we no-till. And I thought I'd start with this picture. This is uh, a group of 100 water buffalo uh, feeder bulls that are on a seven-acre pasture. This was last, I think it was the second week of August. Um, and we'd had some timely July rains, which we don't always get. And we planted our um, warm season covers try to start second week of May. Um, this year we're a little behind because of, we've had moisture, but you can see those are, you know, those are frame four um, water buffalo. I mean, comparatively to beef cattle and you, they're over belly deep in, you know, the uh, brown top millet, um, sorghum sedan grass, and we'll go over some of the spe specifics later. Um, and not only is it so unique, Jordan has made life even more unique because our largest numerically speaking group of ruminants are water buffalo. So um, have a lot of unique features and Jordan likes unique things. That's why he has a chiropractor um, who has <laughs> been in practice for 30 years and raised uh, grass-fed beef on the side now as his ranch manager. So um, I guess he likes to do things a little bit outside the bubble. But um, water buffalo, you know, worldwide, there's an extremely large population. There's only maybe a million and a half, maybe two million. I've not, I've seen varying numbers here in the United States. We've got 300 and just right around 300 uh, mama cows. And then the assorted calves that come off of that um, at this time. And we are selecting for meat, not milk. Water buffalo has made famous over the years for their um, Mozz water buffalo mozzarella, which I've had, haven't had the privilege of that. I've done, I've had the milk and the uh, ice cream, but it's uh, thirty dollars a pound mozzarella. That they say once you've had it, you'll never go back. The Italians have made that famous, but we're not set up for milking anymore. Our old milk parlor, um, very large milk facility, um, where we they made cheese, etc., is out now. Actually, a nutraceutical manufacturing uh, facility. So we're focusing on meat. So that's where we're at. And people ask me, is it possible, oops, excuse me, I went the wrong way. Is it possible to um, integrate annual cover crops into the fescue belt of the thin soiled Ozark Plateau? I say it is possible because we're seeing it. And the recipe in my opinion is we have a great God. Look at Psalms 86, eight through 10. You have to have great faith. And you need great counselors, Proverbs 2018. Keith and Davis and the rest of the crew of uh, Green Cover, uh, the Rodale Group, um, Ryan um, White, Brandon Dalton, Richie Hume from Snaplands. Those are just some of the counselors that uh, we lean on here um, to come up with some wise, wise choices. Uh, we need great seed, which Green Cover has been vital from the word go of this program. And I cannot speak highly enough of the quality of the seed um, I've just seen different people down here have different seed companies and they just haven't had quite the results that we do. So kudos to, to uh, Brian, Keith, Davis, and everybody else there at the Green Cover. And I have a great team of ranch hands and I have a great team of livestock. The picture on the right there, that is actually our um, some of our summer annuals coming up. No, excuse me, that's our, um, our fall planting annuals coming up in early spring a year ago. Um, like I said, we don't till anything. It's just no-till drilled. We have a very basic drill and um, we use the animals to do our work. In my opinion, we need some required tools. We need forage harvesting equipment. We need tillage equipment, uh, planting equipment, quality seed like I spoke with, spoke about, 
um, plenty of sunlight, which we usually have here in the Ozarks, and moisture, which is a give and take. And I know I'm not, I shouldn't complain because I know maybe some of you guys watching and gals watching this are in a very dry area, but um, that is obviously a very rate limiting uh, ingredient. This is how we harvest and how we till. Um, this is a group of that same group of bulls I showed in the earlier picture. Um, they left the ranch averaging almost 1,150 pounds at about 26, 27 months, which is pretty quick for a buffalo. Um, they have a slower maturity. They have a slower rumen. Um, they can do really good things with some more lignified, um, heavier forage that are, I shouldn't say, over mature forage that a typical beef cow really won't do as well because they're rumen just slow churns. They have a higher bacterial fungi protozoan. Uh, overall critter count in the rumen. I think that's one of the aspects that they bring to the table that assets they bring to the table that they're actually inoculating that soil in a very unique way, uh, different than the cattle and the sheep and the goats. But um, they have a larger foot and they can definitely make a little more of an impact on that soil when they're they're stepping. Um, their feet hold up extremely well to wet environments. Not that we have that here a lot, but we do have wet, soggy kind of winters. Um, their feet hold up really well. And that's kind of what they're known for worldwide why they make great animals for rice patties. Um, this is a picture of a, what we Jordan called the flirt experiment. Um, I'll get to another picture and coming up here, but in this group, we had 0.7 acre paddocks made with polynetting that we moved every day of the year, 365 days a year. Um, and we had buffalo, beef cattle, um, hair sheep and goats, followed with ducks and chickens. It was part of a really intensive um, research project and we fed food waste to the fowl that came after that was leftover vegetable waste etc from um, health food stores uh, we don't do this program anymore we had five and a half hour one-way trips to get our food waste from kansas city three and a half hour to memphis and two and a half hours to uh, round trip to springfield missouri but it did some interesting things to the soil and uh, it was interesting to see all the different manure and impact of the different species um, this is a just a picture. We have a commercial cow beef herd. Um, this is a group of 24 heifers that we had out. This is our spring um, explosion this year of our fall um, cover crop blend that we no-tilled into our fescue dominant uh, pastures. This is out over a seven acre pasture. Uh, we left those in there about four days. And the whole goal is to obviously harvest over half, give or take, trample the rest. Um, this year we've got some timely rains and we've been actually able to go back over some of these paddocks now twice um, before we actually were, uh, were drilling into them, which is, that's the first time we've been able to do that because our moisture has just been really great this year. Um, this picture of some goats. We do have a small contingency of goats that we do in uh, for brush control. Um, we have large paddocks. I need to have probably 1500 goats, but we don't have quite the fencing infrastructure in those uh, locations yet, but they do a good job. They uh, obviously browse the forbs, uh, the woody bushes. We have a lot of blackberry intrusion, uh, Himalayan blackberries, uh, buckbrush, and uh, bur oak. Because um, the Ozarks are always trying to kind of return back to a to a uh, um, a forest. Um, this picture is kind of cool. This is an irrigated section of ground that it's 53 acres where we had those 0.7 acre rotations. Um, we, this was last fall. I only irrigated this, I think nine times, um, cause we didn't have that 0.7 acre, um, high density movement going on, but those are 95 pound, 90, 85 to 95 pound average, um, hair sheep. This was last, I believe it was first of September. That's an 800 pound heifer there. And you can see that this is our second, I think possibly, no, this is our second pass on this paddock of our warm season um cover crop into fescue uh, pastures and it's gotten so tall you can't hardly see the uh, the grazing animals so they really did exceptionally well the market lambs did well uh, and the heifers really put on a lot of flesh and uh, came through this really in an excellent shape this year we're actually going to be harvesting uh, hay off of this we're transitioning to uh, become certified organic with our livestock uh, the ground has been certified organic since 2008 and the and also we're working for regenerative organic certified with our livestock. So we have to harvest our own hay because organic hay in this area is not easy, if it, if at all possible, to get a hold of. 
So we're going to use this uh, this section for actually hay production. We poured a lot of nutrition on there with our uh, intensive grazing. I like this one. This is a water buffalo in a ghillie suit. Um, they uh, they use their horns. They really throw stuff up. They kind of do some micro tilling at times. They don't tear the soil up there terribly, but that vetch was so thick as they eat the undersword, they just he just kind of came up with the the head full. So I wish I could have that much hair, but that's just not my lot in life. Um, here's another harvesting tool picture. That's uh, 90 wean calves. These uh, calves we weaned on the 3rd of May uh, came off our water buffalo herd. They averaged 470 pounds. You can see on the right-hand side of the picture where they're at, um, they've been in there, I think that was two and a half days, and that was, I think, seven, 6.7 acres or 7.7 .7 acres maybe in this one. And then you can see on the left where um, it has not been grazed. That's our uh, fall planted uh, spring annuals coming through in abundance. And actually, I should have—I didn't get a picture taken, but the field on the left now looks almost as the field on the right now looks like what's on the left. And that's been 32 days since we rested. We've drilled into it, and now I've got cover crops coming into this abundant, you know, regrowth of our spring annuals. So it's pretty exciting this year. This is just another picture on the left. Just a reverse shot of what we just looked at. Um, grazed down well, what litter, you know, trampled down the ground. We've got good soil contact with all the uh, carbon rich um, residue. And over on the right, what we haven't hit. One thing we've noticed our early numbers coming in, our PLFA tests, um, we're seeing a threefold increase of our biology count in the top three inches. And I don't remember what the second three inches, but our uh, biology counts are blowing up. And actually, the lab called and said, is this the same ranch? So I was thrilled to hear that. Um, and where organic matter is ticking up, uh, average organic matter in this area is probably around 1.5, maybe 2%. Um, we've got some up to 4.5%. And some of that was coming up before we started this intensive program. But this particular section of the ranch had been pine forest eight years ago. A lot of um, pine duff we used they used, excuse me, it was before me, um, didn't, when they planted different things, never really took, um, they used crushed eggshell for calcium source also to kind of neutralize some of the, uh, the pH, did some chicken litter, but this place has, this piece of ground has not blown up like this since we started doing the uh, annual rope, annual cover crops with uh, rotation. So it's really exciting to see the biology and the numbers from the studies coming up. This is a picture, this is on the north end the picture you just saw previously is on a half mile south. Um, I just took them out of this pasture two days ago. You can see how they laid everything down. We're getting a little mature on the rye. Um, the triticale is starting to, you know, lose leaf under, excuse me, the vetch is starting to lose leaf underneath. It's starting to mature out. We've got pods coming. Doesn't seem to phase them. Um, I've read that, you know, there's some photosensitivity issues that you sometimes need to watch. We threw sheep out here last year with no problem. Um, and this is only three and a half pounds an acre of vetch is in that blend. So we're not going to plant this year, but um, you can see how they laid everything down. The lignified, you know, you know, rye stalks are laying there. Um, they just did a really grab, good job of laying it down and tilling. So that's our version of burn down um, here in the Ozarks. And that's just a close up picture. You can see the manure there has already been worked on by, you know, the, some of the soil beetles. And the, we have the small dung beetles. I have not seen any of the large ones here yet, um, but the soil critter life above the ground and below the ground is definitely uh, really flourishing. So in, in this picture here, this is uh, at 625, averaging probably 1,250 pound animals because the water buffalo. But so there's about 600,000 pounds of animal pressure in a six acre paddock. That picture, and there's one coming up that shows you what 12 hours looks like afterwards. And this was our first spring after planting fall cover crops. Supplied by Green Cover again. Another plug, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bur uh, Burns. Um, this picture shows it. Don't judge me for the cattle. Um, I came here and inherited um, Jersey um, Brahma crosses, and uh, that was done for purpose. The Jersey cows' feet did not hold up well to the Ozark rock, so they bred Brahma bulls and a few other types on some of these cows trying to put better feet. And then when they got rid of the dairy, they kept these cows as brood cows. 
So you can see the horn and the, some of the Brahma resemblance. But what I want you to really look at is that's our summer annual crop. That was two years ago, five feet tall. That was the that was morning one. Uh, excuse me, that was two o'clock in the afternoon. And the next morning at seven o'clock, you can see what they've done to it. Um, they have cleaned it off. That's about 650,000 pounds of pressure, 600, 650, because there's some calves in there, um, on six acres in about 14, 15 hours. Um, so they did a great job of grazing it, laying down the uh, um, all the dry matter left over. And that is what I think a big part of why we're really seeing some of the biology changes. We've got covers, we've got biomass, and then we've got animals eating it and, uh, and tilling it, if you would. I just like this picture, it's a young steer. It's a fall two years ago. That was second graves through uh, our summer annuals that uh, in our 53 acres and uh, relishing, I think that's a pearl millet stock. So stock, excuse me. It's really fun to watch them eat the heads off those black oil sunflower seeds as well. Here's another picture, polynetting, same thing. Somewhere out there behind that polynetting is a bunch of 90 pound hair sheep, but good luck finding them. Um, but they were, I was 24, uh, beef heifers on and right at a hundred market lambs on four acres. And we moved them about every two, two and a half days. So again, grazing it, laying it down, increasing our soil biology, soil carbon, and uh, the exchange rate just keeps exponentially growing. Here's a picture of what 3000 ducks and chickens look like in 0.7 acres. Actually, that's actually 1.4 acres. We had to double it because it was wet. Um, they did a great job laying down a lot of manure, but ducks are little jackhammers in terms of compaction. And if you have moisture and it gets a little slurry and a little slick, that little beak is like a little jackhammer. So at that concentration, that it caused a little issue, but uh, they did do a lot of good things, the bug count, et cetera. And uh, again, their manure is just different than everybody else's that was in the program. We have real basic equipment. We have a 10 foot Great Plains no-till drill and a 1983 John Deere tractor. And that's what we drill with. Um, picture on the left, we grazed through it. We had so much grass, I needed to get my fall covers in. Um, so you can see I had a lot of trash, a lot of uh, standing residue. The drill laid it down nicely. And for those earlier pictures you saw were that abundance of growth, that's what we went into. So I wasn't afraid to go into a lot of residue because uh, the covers have They've proven they can do it. Um, I think there's a lot of fear out there that, oh, you can't plant in that heavy. I, I would tend to disagree. Um, now this piece of ground, we we graze this extremely short because this is a very densely, um, this field has been in Kentucky 31 fescue predominantly since like the mid seventies. So we grazed it really hard, really short. And then we drilled into it to try to make sure that our covers would get up ahead of the fescue. This is a fall. This is a year ago. Did really quite well. This has not been as easy to transition. Not all the fields have been this well established in the Kentucky 31, but um, in this one field, this one third, we never plowed. I'm kind of glad we didn't use it as a control. Um, but we have gone back through, you know, grazed it short, drilled it, and then came back in about seven to nine days later and grazed it again. So any fescue that was starting to out compete or get ahead of some of our covers, we graze back, but I've only done that once and I haven't had really any significant problem uh, staying ahead of the fescue. This is a picture of uh, some volunteer crimson clover, 2021 fall, we had crimson clover, we haven't planted it since, this was this year. Um, I just like this picture, this is on that little core ground up here um, in the north end of the ranch, that was a pine forest, you've got the crimson clover, you've got red clover, you've got the I think that's the triticale in there, some of the rye. And that little yellow, there's there's some buttercup, but there's a little bunch, they call it hop clover. I'm not sure what the technical term is, but that is, we haven't planted that and it has come back and it's a it's more of a quote unquote native legume. I don't believe it's historically native. It was introduced at some point, but it's really done a great job. So I, I just like the fact I can look down at the ground and I don't see the ground. Um, when we started this program four years ago, we had about 50 to 60%. I believe I'm using the right terms. I'm no expert, but basal cover, you could see a fair amount of dry, uh, bare ground. Last fall uh, and this spring, again, we had nearly 100% on the entire part of the ranch that that ground was covered with something either dead, um, decadent, or, uh, or growing plants. That's a picture of uh, 
our fescue up here on the north end of the ranch. It's a higher fescue. This is another section that been in um, Kentucky 31 since 1974 or five. The vetch is really out competing. It's hard to see the clover. It's coming up in there um, extremely well. And until we started using the vetch in this particular piece uh, of ground, we had not seen um, a legume really take hold. And now we've, we're seeing the red clover we planted. We're seeing the crimson clover come back voluntarily. And what we're seeing the ladina white and some of the others. So it's, and the hop clover is really, so it's, it's cool to see the biology working together. And I know that's a fungal bacterial thing and I'm not an expert on that ratio, but all I know is biology is coming about alive. And that's what I'm really excited about. Here's just a picture of, well, it's a back end of my truck. You can see how tall the, um, this is non-irrigated. Um, and this was a year and a half. This was last year when we had a little more August timely range. You can see the pearl millet. There's a little sun hemp in there. I think I have a picture coming up, um, but the sorghum Sudan grass, and it just really did well, but we, we had some really timely rains. And I had to plug my favorite company because I think the cup fits, and this is just a great biodiversity picture um, with what we had and what we've added and what's growing. So I just think it's kind of a fun picture I took out in the pasture the other day. That's a picture of our summer blend we've got going on right now. And I'm gonna go over like the, um, the blend mixes. So this is our fall and our summer, our fall last year and our summer this year, um, cover crop blends that Davis and Keith have helped me uh, put together. We've tweaked. I have a couple uh, coming up here that were previous blends, um, but this is what we planted last year. The Warrior Vets, Red Clover, uh, the Hazlitt Cereal Rye, triticale and uh, perennial rye. We upped the triticale last year and downplayed the, the cereal rye a little bit. The cereal rye seemed to get up so much faster and then it went to kind of a higher, it got to maturity faster. And the, uh, I think it was Keith or Davis maybe suggested that we try a little more triticale because it'll pace a little more evenly with the vetch and some of the other things. And I think it did really well, it stayed a little more leafy, uh, didn't get to mature before, uh, full maturity before we um, got on it to graze, which worked out very well. Um, we also planted, uh, I think it's 30 or 40 pounds of vetch, and I, I don't remember my poundage on some straight hay ground, and that's done really well with the triticale. Uh, the rye just got up above it, and it went, uh, it just kind of matured out faster, so the triticale and the vetch have paced themselves really well. Um, and the summer blend, what we're drilling right now, the clay and cow peas, four pounds an acre mung beans, um, like I said earlier, we dropped the pearl millet and we're going with some Japanese and the white wonder millet uh, in addition to the brown top millet. Um, brown top has done exceptionally well here. And uh, one of the locals, I, I don't think you're doing well unless somebody around you says, hey, what's going on? That looks different. And a couple of the guys at uh, Baylor Hay that they're that are not afraid to ask questions. And uh, they noticed that our pastures look so much different on a couple of sections that butted up against the county roads they travel on. And they said they remembered their grandfather planting some type of millet and vetch when they were kids and they haven't done it in 30 years. Um, well, last year they planted some uh, some vetch and some millet. So we're making changes. Um, the um, the impact collards, uh, the forage collards have been a really great addition. Um, they survived the frost and, and we've had some really great stands of the collards throughout the year, but they really keep growing after we get cold late, somewhere mid to late October. Buckwheat's done well, and then uh, we upped the black oil sunflower. Uh, we need that dark, that long tiller root. We have a fair amount of compaction. Um, no, that's, that's an understatement. We have a lot of compaction in the Ozarks. Um, we lack that thing called organic matter, but we're gaining. Um, and this is just a picture of what we did uh, previously uh, last spring and the, and the fall before. Very similar, just tweaked a few of the things. I like the Boston plantain. We're probably going to put some of that back in next year. Uh, it seeds itself down. For a human and animal uh, snippet of uh, snippet of trivia, the plantain is the most rich, the richest omega-3 fatty acid um, plant that you can uh, put in your pastures. And chickens really thrive on it. Does really well for eggs. And a friend of mine had bought a little house in Peoria, and I, I was from there. And uh, he bought this house, and it was abandoned. And he woke up the first Saturday morning when he moved in and there was like a whole group of like 15 people in his front yard, like picking things. And he went out front and he asked them, can I ask what you're doing? And they said, oh, we, this is an abandoned house. He goes, well, not anymore. I own it. And what are you planting? They were picking the plantain out of his yard 
they were they were all from uh, immigrants from Greece, and uh, they knew the benefits of plantain, and they were harvesting his yards for their salad. So, kind of a cool thing. So, uh, the plantain's been a real cool addition; has done well. And with like I said, we just tweaked the the sunflower up and and modified. We dropped the uh, sun hemp on our non irrigated ground last this year, and we're only going to put that in our irrigated because it just doesn't seem to do well if we get a dry spell. Um, I just like black oil sunflowers, and um, I think these are some cool pictures, just, you know, multiple heads of the, the plant in the middle, and then you can see some sun hemp in the background, and the bumblebees, the pollinators are just having a party um, on our pastures, and to me, that's just stinking cool. Uh, this is my great team. I got three ranch hands. Uh, my daughter's on the left putting reindeer gloves on top of a water buffalo. Uh, we got Randy and Sean, but... Uh, Nobody had worked with Buffalo before we started here, and uh, we've all become big fans. No two years alike. We plan and God chuckles, right? Um, so what we see on the left, at September 2022, you can see the collards and a little bit of the beans, I think, in there. That stuff was only about this tall in September because we went 97 days without rain after planting. You can see a little pearl millet shot up there. We got some rain and then everything started popping. And now on the right, you can see this year's summer annuals you now having to compete with all this vetch that's come back. That's actually been a hard grazed field. That I made a mistake on that field. We left them in there too long. That was almost like bare dirt. And you can see that we've got a lot of uh, biological um, forgiveness there because it's really popping back. What do they say? Make your mistakes in spring and you'll look like a genius. Make make your mistakes in the summer and you'll look like an idiot. So thankfully, this one I did in the springs. <laughs> um, this is the same thing. This is a non-irrigated field, summer annuals. You can see there's some sorghum sedan. The, the brown top millet is just thick as thieves in here. This seed laid there for 97 days with no moisture. And the next picture I'm going to show you, same blend. That's irrigated almost the same day. And we've got stuff six, seven feet. I'm six foot tall, so that's seven, eight feet. And then you can see what we lay down. And the next picture shows we had to drag the bucket of the tractor to put our polynetted in because you couldn't walk through it. But again, barely tall as a four-wheeler, but we had rain and then it just shot up and went to seed. And we had some great volunteer mill the next year because that that plant, I don't know what the I don't know the biology, Keith, you can explain it. Shot up, went to maturity, put seed on, those cattle ate it. And um, it really just started adding the seed back to the bank. So just really cool. Same time, a little bit of moisture makes all the difference. Um, and no two years alike, sometimes the wheels come off. Um, actually, was that was a load of a dozen water buffalo heifers in a 90 degree day in the middle of nowhere in Missouri. So thankfully I had bought extra tires and uh, two floor jacks and nobody stopped to help. Imagine that. Um, and then I had to find a shop to take out the... Uh, the rim. And sometimes we get too much rain. This was a year ago in March. Um, this is where we were running the 0.7 acres. We had to let the animals go because it was a flood. Sorry about that. And this is too little rain. Um, similar pasture just down the way. One cool thing I wanted to see, and this you may or may not be able to see it, all the cowbirds. Um, they have really symbiotically shown up and they love the, the water buffalo and they love them because they pick the flies. But there is cover crop planted in here, but it's mainly just less desirable plants, but the buffalo, you know, did very well off of it. Um, but you can see how the covers that year just really struggled. That was that 97 day drop. Um, this is an experiment. You might not be able to tell that is organic yellow corn planted into cheat fescue. Um, we grow mushroom mycelia in the manufacturing plant here, and they had some corn that had a few bugs and things and they couldn't use it. So I saved it over winter and we drilled it in at 90 pounds an acre. I don't know what the, the, the population count would be, but it's coming up with all that green competition. We grazed this fairly short and I thought I had another picture. I guess I don't, but I was just thrilled to see that coming up. So, and some of it's actually up about 18 inches, but others is like this about a foot tall, but kind of fun. And this is what, drought can look like here. This is actually a really good pasture. Uh, a year ago, when uh, two years ago when we were really dry, that had been resting for about 65, 70 days, but we at least had something for them to eat. 
Oh, there's the other picture of the corn. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, you can see we got some of the foreground, some of the background. It's kind of fun. Um, I mean, I didn't have to buy the seed, so let's go not waste it. Uh, turkeys sure enjoyed it. They, I think, picked up a lot of our seed. Um, and Keith wanted me to touch on results, and I was really tickled with this. I just found this. Uh, we took and weighed yesterday. Got 90 water buffaloes, and they were in the earlier picture. They were weaned last. They were weaned May 3rd. We we carry our buffalo on mamas through winter, but uh, they weighed 470 pounds going in. And in 30, what is that, 36, 38 days? I can't remember reading my notes there because, yeah, 36 days, they gained 2.71 pounds, 103 pounds of gain. And they came, that was wean, two days later, thrown on grass. And that was it. We did, it was hands off. And I thought I was thrilled that they came off uh, hard weaning and gained that kind of weight in um, in, a, in 36 days. Um, and then I had a, one of these water buffalo bulls, a small one, he was a small one last year. He came in uh, out of winter at 800 pounds and he gained 3.95 pounds a day. I butchered him three weeks ago. Um, and we had an early spring up and uh, I just went ahead and gambled and threw him out there and a couple others on some of this really early fall. Um, annuals in our our pastures and he gained almost four pounds a day in 42 days and that i know that's doable in beef cattle i don't know of any i've not seen anybody doing that with and i'm not bragging i'm just thrilled to see a water buffalo put that kind of weight on and that it's obviously the biolog biologically rich soil pulling up those nutrients and all the forage so I think you should. I think you should be bragging. <laughs> that would be impressive on on some of the best cattle genetics, let alone water buffalo. So yeah, good good for you. Yeah, it was exciting. I I I had to look twice at the scale. I'm like, there's no way he did that, but he did. And actually, the guy we had him uh, butchered at, he said he was probably the best cutting buffalo that I've taken. He was about 27 months old, um, and like I said earlier, they're a little slower maturing. Um, this is just a nice panoramic view. This is actually uh, early last fall or late summer. You can see some of the summer annuals there. Um, we didn't get the August. Uh, no, this area of the farm didn't get some of those August rains. Like the ranch is five miles long by two miles wide. So this didn't get as much moisture. But if you look close, our uh, summer annuals are in there. And actually about a week after this picture, it really started popping. So we fattened up some beef and buffalo calves on that. And they did exceptionally well. And my talk, but I said, I took this the other day. I have this little Hereford steer that I'm fattening for myself with these wieners, but don't be afraid to look different than the crowd. Um, he's standing out there. Just, he doesn't, he's proud as a peacock, doesn't know he's different, but uh, I, I just encourage everybody just to be bold enough to, to take a leap and do and look and be different. And, and who cares what the critics say? Um, eventually they'll be coming around to ask you maybe what were you doing? And um, so that that's just a fun picture, I thought. Oops, and that's kind of what I had prepped there, Mr. Burns. So, well, that's great. And, and like I say, I, I think you uh, should feel should feel proud because you know the numbers that you're putting up would be great. You know, with some of the best cattle genetics, let alone uh, with the buffalo. So yeah, I've got a ton of questions. People are putting a few questions in. Go ahead, great. folks. Uh, continue to put questions in either the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll get to those in a little bit here. But I, I just, I want to go back, well, to a number of things. But first of all, you are doing the interseeding, both summer annuals and winter annuals, warm season and cool season. Right. This is all going into perennial fescue pastures, or do you have some areas where it doesn't have perennials? Does everything have perennials? Everything's got perennials. We have uh, the only quote unquote tilled bare soil, we had a, a 20 acre pass, uh, paddock down in the low ground that was flooded out years ago. And that's where we've actually done only exclusive hay. But every picture you saw is all in a perennial stand of a pasture. We don't have anything that's, that's tilled and bare. Okay. And that's, that's really impressive because, you know, typically, the typical mindset is you really can only do that if your perennials have gone pretty dormant. So cool season pasture, like your fescue, right? We wouldn't really want to do a lot of cool season annuals, but you're doing it and having great success with that. Right. Yeah. And I think it's a combination that, you know, we're using the animals to, 
to burn down, if you would, you know, they're grazing it. And I learned that from a guy, I don't know if it was you or David, somebody told me years ago, there was a dairy guy that he would do the same thing. He would graze it short, plant, and then he would come back and graze again. And that interlude before those, you know, that cover crop got up. I've only had to do it a couple of times. Maybe it's because, you know, we're usually a little lagging on soil moisture and, and, you know, we can be pretty tough at times, but I haven't had to only do that, but once. Um, and, and once those annuals get up, and I think it's because the biology is waking up or organic matter is coming around. Um, they just, they just pop up and start moving. So. And, and those are all, those are fall planted. So you're doing winter biannual things that overwinter the batch, the yeah. the rye, rye grass, things like that. Yeah. My goal is to get in there September 1st. You know, if we have moisture, I'll wait a little bit. If our, if our fall rains have lagged, I kind of wait. And then I just follow right behind my herds when they're grazing that off. You know, I just, literally the day after they come out, I'm trying to go into those. And and in this particular, like where this picture's at, um, those are about seven and a half acre paddocks, which are really easy to just kind of blow through in a, you know, with a 10 foot drill, um, you know, in a, in a couple hours. And, and I think that's a point worth uh, emphasizing too, is that, you know, a lot of times people think they have to have this really big equipment in order to cover the acres, but yeah. the way you're doing it, you know, you, you may be drilling, hundreds of days out of the year but because you're doing that you don't have to get hundreds of acres a day done right yeah well we, we're we've got 600 acres worth of seed to do for this summer you know right now our summer annuals are, are in and we've been held up because moisture and such but we'll we'll get it in and i think we've got enough carryover moisture i'm not getting i'm not getting too worried about being a little later than i wanted to be and um and i my goal is always to be in by the 15th of May, falling those animals and, you know, blowing through. And I, I have the luxury also, I can bring larger herds of animals up to make, like when I brought 600 animals up, I can go through two to three paddocks a day. So I can actually get that ground cleared in short order if I need to. But I've been trying to use, save this now for these feeder animals, you know, so I can actually get some return on that investment. Not that building the soil is not a return, but some cash flow. Um, just like these water buffalo, I'm 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 selling at about 35% of what I could if they were were cattle. <laughs> so so I, I need to maximize my return. So um, but that's the key. I can get in there fast if I need to because I can bring more mouths to you know to to burn it to burn down if you would. So I know that a question that a lot of people would have is is there a risk of hurting or damaging your perennial stand by going so heavy on the annuals. Now with K31, you can't hardly kill that stuff. So, no. No. Not in my experience. I mean, it, it's pretty much atomic bomb proof. Um, not quite, but I mean, yeah, you can overgraze it. And we've got a lot of, you know, you could probably see in the earlier pictures, we've got a fair amount of cheat grass, um, but it's done well. And and I, I won't forget what you told me a couple of years ago when you, when I, when you came out, you said, Let's go two or three years of these annuals, a couple of times a year, plant them. Let's get the biology woke up. And then let's come back through and try to get some of our native warm seeds and grasses planted once you're getting the biology, because those seeds obviously are more expensive, a little more finicky to get started. And you got a little more forgiveness with these annuals to actually, you know, to grease the wheel, as it were. And I think that's what we're doing. So I'm, you know, you have helped me in Drexel Atkinson and he got his uh, recipe. So this fall, we're going to try that in this, one of these pastures right here, probably the one you're looking at, and we're going to come down and I'm just going to graze it to the nubbins, and then I'm going to use those native warm seasons. I, you know, I don't have luxury of a chemical burn down because we are certified organic, and we're going to do an experiment. We'll see if we can't get some of these perennials there, and then like Drexel said in his one talk I heard, he goes, well, then I can stagger. I can have a fescue and a warm season, you know, perennial, you know, so then I can kind of checkerboard around and that's kind of one of my goals to see if we can't do that and you know I've got seven acre up to 90 acre 100 acre paddocks that we split with polywire so you know in my constant thinking process I'm like oh, that'd be really kind of cool if I could kind of checkerboard once I get the biology really awakened to come back in and put those I mean they're not here because they got overgrazed and poorly managed I mean that's why Kentucky 31 I remember when I first came here and you know I got a lot of that. You ain't around here, are you, boy? Um, and <laughs> I'm not. Um, but uh, one of the old guys who worked for me goes, 
boy, this is K31 there. You ain't going to change that. And you, you know, no one else has done it either. I'm like, so he's still alive and I have a goal to prove him wrong. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not worried. I haven't seen any downside. Um, yeah. And actually, we're seeing some switchgrass come back. We're seeing some other, you know, like the hot clovers coming up. Some of these other, I think the seed bank is kind of reawakening. Um, and and long rest periods. I can't stress that enough. I mean, when, when we're in our slump, you know, we're not going to try to get back there for 45 days or a little longer. Now, in the spring, I'm only doing about 22-day rotations because I'm actually understocked. I could actually use more miles right now. Um, but some years you have too few and some years you have too many, but, um, <laughs> um, yeah, well, and, and I think that's a great point. You know, I think you have awoken your biology and these other things, the hop clover and some of these other things that you're starting to reemerge, I think as a, there's biological signals now within your system of we're ready for more diversity. And so, yeah, I think it is time to start introducing some other species that will give you additional grazing at additional times of the year so yeah i think that the, the year you came out and, and it was actually i'm standing on the back side of that fence in that field which sits right behind the house i live in i found maybe two to three worms per shovel full if i can get the shovel in the ground now i haven't done this year but last fall i went down there and i was finding 18 to 30 worms per, per shovel full i mean and that's just another indicator, like you said, the biology is reawakening, you know, the worm castings and, and, and then you just see, you know, we had the Audubon Society out here and I think there was like 70 some odd species of birds and she saw a number of species that she hadn't seen in other ranches in the area. So, um, and, and the butterflies and the bugs and the pollinators, I mean, I was on a four wheeler the other day ordering a part for another four wheeler and the guy's like, where are you at? I'm like, why? He goes, is that like, because I had on speaker, he goes, I can barely hear you. It's like the bugs and the birds in the background are almost too deafening. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I was thrilled that he couldn't hear me because of all the critters in the ground. Through the phone. Yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty great. I, yeah. So you said something about, you know, you know how the soil has changed. And, and you said that a lot of the organic matter in that area would be, you know, one to one and a half percent. Yeah. And now you're up to four on some of your ground and probably continuing to go up. I mean, that's a, that's a huge feat. That's a huge achievement. And, you know, good soil gets better and poor soil gets worse uh, kind of a thing. So I think that will be the engine that continues to allow you to drive, drive that change forward and give you the resilience to get right. through about the 97 days without rain. Yeah. You can survive. Well, and, and some of that organic matter had come up before we started this intensive plant, but I just seen the jumps, you know, it's not like a percent a year or anything, but we're seeing bigger incremental jumps in the last two years. And I think, like you said, the compounding effects are just, uh, are, are coming around. And, and one thing I've noticed, you know, we do get gully washer rains and we, you know, we're very hilly and topographically very challenged. I have not noticed that dark runoff I and mean, we get some runoff, but it's clear water runoff when we get it. So that alone makes me thrilled. I mean, that we're not yeah. seeing that topsoil here is such a precious commodity. Not that it isn't anywhere, everywhere, but not to see it just run down the ditch is, is pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, I want to make just a couple of comments here on a couple of the plant species that you talked about. And then we've got uh, some questions. The audience has chipped in here. And so folks feel, feel free to continue to put questions in there. You know, you were talking about the plantain, and and yeah, that would be a little disconcerting to wake up and find all <laughs> people harvesting in your yard, right? But um, I've also heard that plantain, and and a lot of the plantain that we get comes from New Zealand, where they're a heavily livestock grazing based system. Plantain will actually help reduce the methane man, man, emissions oh. coming out of livestock as well, and so it's actually being mandated by part of the government and different programs because it does a lot of things. It's a natural anthelmetic, you know, dewormer. Yep. Uh, you know, you said it has the highest concentration of omega-3s, but it, it also can, and, and maybe because of that, it's helping reduce those methane emissions. So interesting. Plantain is a wonderful thing to get uh, going. And when we use chicken, have you tried chicory? We did uh, in our first blend, we our fall blend we put in, but we got in so late that year because when the wheels got turning, we got our seed ordered late. And my goal is to put that back in. So we did it in 50 acres and, and we had a pretty good expression, but 
my goal is to put more of it in more ground this fall. Yeah, yeah, because because chicory and plantain are both you know those really deep rooted forms. They yeah. they have such deep root systems. They're really good at accumulating minerals because they can pull from depth. Right. And so those those two are are commonly used as interseeded forms. Um, and then one other comment, you know, you mentioned brown top millet a number of times. And the reason that it's called brown top, you know, most of these millets, when they mature, you know, that whole plant kind of dies and dries right. up. The whole plant is brown. Well, brown top millet is called brown top because when it matures, the seed head turns brown because the seed is mature, but the plant stays green. Ah, and okay. Gotcha. So that's why it's called brown top. And so it is, it's probably one of the better millets for extending the grazing period because even at seed maturity the plant still has a lot of green and a lot of palatability to it so um in it, it the further south you go the better it tends to work as well so i uh, got a few questions from some folks here that are uh participating uh barry's asking you showed the picture of that steer that gained 3.95 yeah. pounds a day 800 pounds is that what it started at or did, is that what it came out at no, he started that. He started at 800 and then came out at four pounds a day times however many days. Yeah, I was like, I think he, I can't remember the numbers, but I, as I back there, yeah, he went in at 800. So, I mean, I think that's where I, you know, I was hoping to get three plus on, I was close on these water buffalo wieners, but, you know, coming off weaning and, uh, and buffalo don't stress wean like cattle do. So I, I didn't have, I wasn't too worried about that, that slump post wean. Oh. Um, and I did not castrate, so there was no castration. And that—that that is a mixed heifer and bull group, too, at 2.7 pounds a day. So that's not just straight bulls, either. Is that pretty common that you, because I know you mentioned uh, feeder bulls and not feeder steers. Do you typically feed those out to market weight as bulls? It it depends on who's the market. Uh, the, the different sources that sell them into these ethnic markets, some want them all intact, some, and few want steers. And I just steered some last year just to kind of get a comparison on versus gain. And I, I did get more gain on the steer side than the bull side, but right. some of those ethnic markets, they want those animals intact. And Jordan would prefer that too, but I thought we'd just challenge a little bit. Yeah. Just yeah. Side by side and see what we'd find. Sure. Well, Cher Cheryl is asking, you know, she's fascinated as, as, as most of us are that you're raising water buffalo in the <laughs> Southern Missouri, but that's pretty cool. Anybody else in your area doing this? And then what is what does your market look like? You know, where you know who who who's eating these critters? <laughs> no, not enough people, but where is your market right <laughs> now? The well, the uh there there are a few small groups in the area and more like Arkansas and then further south. I don't think there's a lot much further north than us because if you don't have shelter, uh, we do bring our buffalo in. We it, as a dairy, they had a large loafing shed and corrals. I can bring them in now to the extreme cold weather. Um, we have gotten along. The buffalo and I, have, we've really learned from each other and the team. Um, one of the first buffalo breeders I talked to, his dad was the second one to bring uh, animals in. He said, beef are like checkers, buffalo, water buffalo are like chess. So you got to think. And so you're not going to force them. You're not going to push them. You got to work with them. But we've got a symbiosis working. But our, our primary customer base at this point, I have been selling live fat animals to different growers. Uh, one's in Ohio. He sells to like the Cleveland and in some of those bigger metropolitan areas up there. There's a gentleman in North Carolina that sells into some of that mid-Atlantic part of the, of the East Coast. Uh, there's a gentleman down by Texarkana. He's a longtime breeder and he sells into the Dallas market and also into the New York City market. So your, your, your Hmong, Cambodian, Thai, um, those are your biggest ethnic groups that actually want buffalo and are aware of it. And unfortunately, there's not any within 300 miles of Koshkanong, Missouri. <laughs> so, um, and we finally now have a uh, an exotic arbiter that will slaughter for us. But jumping into the uh, the frozen meat delivery business, I, I was part of U.S. Wellness Meats. They've got a well-oiled machine, but that was learned through a lot of hard knocks. Um, so we haven't jumped off into that yet. Um, but I'd love to see it. So if you know anybody looking for water buffalo, Keith has my numbers, please reach out. <laughs> I'm always looking for buyers because it's been a challenge. But previously when the milk 
buffalo, water buffalo thing was going, your heifers could be sold at a premium if you had them really calmed down, tamed down, you know, you could, and they'll tame down like dogs really quite easily. But the milk buffalo market's kind of dried up, no pun intended. Um, and now even the heifers are going into the meat side. So we're going to have to work harder at moving into the uh, either the retail customer base or uh, Jordan's always on the cutting edge. We, we've even played around with the freeze-dried water buffalo dog treat. Um, and I've done some... Uh, I've done some experiments with the guy that uh, I know that has does freeze drying and uh, it will freeze dry, but it it's a little coarser. It takes a double grind, especially when the animal gets older to get that, you know, that water to move out of the meat. Um, but we've, the proof of concept is there, but we just haven't got the the wheels all on that, on that truck yet. Okay, good. A couple other questions here. Uh, Cheryl's also just asking about, you know, when you do these plantings, uh, the interseeding, whether it's warm season or cool season, you shoot for a certain number of species. Are you looking at how many different plant families you have in there? You know, what what's kind of your thought process of building that diversity package? Well, that's where I leaned on that great counselor piece. And I went to Keith and Davis <laughs> and I, I wanted diversity. I wanted to try to expand the diversity because, you know, you talk about monoculture corn. We are very monoculture fescue here. And you, you'll hear in fescue country, dilution's a solution, you know, trying to, to get some legumes in there to, to offset that, that fescue. And, and the beef herd, because Jordan bought my group of uh, South Pole and Herefords, and they're all very fescue tolerant. Um, and the cattle that were here were, but a lot of these buffalo came in from, I, we don't even know where, buyers were bringing them in when Jordan was building the herd. And we have had some, some significant struggles with fescue foot you know, we, a lot of dock tails out there in the buffalo, but it's very disheartening when you see those, you know, those hooves start to fall off and you've got to destroy an animal because it's just not going to work. But um, but we've carried enough calves through these cows eating on fescue. Our young, we've only had one young animal that was born here uh, show fescue. So, you know, Fred Provenza exposed the mother, that worked. But my goal is dilution. And then literally with the help of you and Davis, you guys came up with you know, the different families, let's plant some things from the different family groups, let's get some diversity. You guys gave me some great insight with, you know, where we are in climate zone and soil type that would probably give us some success. And I would say it's been, you know, a, a great success. So I, I owe that back to you guys. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know, Cheryl, I would just say, you know, as much diversity as what makes sense, don't throw something in there just so you can you know, make another tick mark on your diversity score if it's not going to have a chance of performing and, and doing something. So uh, one last question here, Michael, and then we'll uh, uh, turn the day back to everybody else. But Barry's asking, uh, and this is a, a great question, you you mentioned hairy batch and that there are some potential toxicity issues, particularly with uh, light-skinned animals like, like sheep, uh, photosensi photosensitivity issues. You said you did not have those issues uh, to, to just elaborate on that a little bit more, did you, were you worried about having those? Uh, did you, you know, how, how strong was the veg component in what they were grazing? Why do you think you didn't have the issues? Well, as you said, as I've sent pictures and Davis has said, I mean, we only put three pounds per acre, right? I mean, we've just had a, a great expression of that veg. Um, so in some areas, I think we had three pounds per acre express itself almost like we did 30 pounds per acre in some poorer soils. Um, but I had light, light skinned hair sheep. I had light skinned, you know, Brahma kind of cross cattle in there. And you can't really see it in this picture. We have some very fair skinned uh, water buffalo. And I just, I read about it and I thought we had enough biodiversity and all these animals had been strictly on forage. We hadn't had anybody with a I always think about if they can't tolerate it, is their gut not accommodating to all forage? Are they are you trying to take an animal that has been creep fed and then force feed it a diet that is going to be hard hard to handle? I don't have science behind it, but that in my experience, it's like taking a, you know, if I move to another country, it's going to take me a while for my digestive system to adapt to that local diet. But I think it's the diversity and the fact that, you know, I have animals that are well adapted to current forage, but I watched them really close for the first three days, you know, the first week and a half, 10 days, especially the sheep. I saw no sunburning, no photosensitivity, no, you know, hiding in the shade, couldn't go out in the, you know, the sunlight. Um, and after I saw that, 
I just went for it and uh, we didn't look back and had no problems. Right. And, and I think that's exactly right. The, you know, that diversity and getting them accustomed to it and used to it is, is a big part of, um, of not having those issues that other people, you know, might, might potentially have. Well, and, and even, even like, uh, what is it when you, your sorghum sedan, you know, it freezes off. What, uh, is that? Acid. Yeah. And, and, first year I, I had not had a lot of experience before I came here we planted it you know we had a very early hard frost we were doing that 0.7 acre move and I really had to move them through there um and I, I spoke with a friend of mine in Illinois who's planted a lot of sorghum sudan grass and of course his animals 100% grass from the time they hit the ground to the time they hit the, the locker and uh you know he had very heavy stands and he said he had not seen any exposure because he had multi-generational grass-fed animals and he goes, plus he threw a goat out ahead of it. And if it didn't die in six hours, it was fine to throw it anymore. So, but right now a goat's so expensive, you hate to do that, you know, but, um, but I mean, they did well and, and they did very well. And I, after the first day, you know, we watched them close. We checked them every couple hours and there was no bloat, no issues. And so, and we didn't have a hundred percent stand, you know, they had a lot to, to, uh, to graze off of. Yeah. So it's like anything, you know, it's all about the management and a good manager can uh, utilize some of those things that a poor manager would run into issues with. So it's no different than any other facet of life. So, yeah. And well, don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, I, I called you up. I called in. I called guys I know that are before because, you know, somebody's got some experience. And if you keep that Rolodex, it's not like what you know, it's who you know. And, and, and then they can give you that confidence and pull you off the edge of the cliff. Yeah, having that having that panel of of experts and consultants. No, that's great advice. And and I think I want to just leave people with this your your last slide here too. Don't be afraid to look different than the crowd. Uh, I think that's great advice because there's just so much that can be gained by trying new things. And you know, thank you for all of you that are watching live and the uh, thousands that will be watching this uh, on YouTube later, you know, to be inspired, to try some new things. Don't be afraid to, to try different things. Not everything's going to work, no. uh, but you know, uh, you know, all the things that you don't try will never work. So don't be afraid to give it a shot. Uh, next week, join us again next week. Uh, our guests will be actually licking. Uh, I, a few of you that are watching this may have been to our workshop that we had here in Bladen last week with Christine Jones. Ashley was one of the speakers on our panel. Ashley and her family are raising seed stock bulls, uh, and actually they're right in our backyard. They're in Webster County, Nebraska here, but they're got, they're raised exclusively on forages, no grain, no pampering. Uh, they're they're really uh, the right kind of cattle for grazing out on cover crops, and uh, the right kind of cattle for making a living and not being pampered. So, uh, tune in to listen to Ashley. I talk about how they're developing bulls for that particular segment of integrating livestock in into your operation. Uh, so hope to see you back next week for that. And Michael, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time and sharing your wisdom and knowledge. Thanks for the opportunity. And, and I, again, kudos to Green Cover. Keep it up. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for joining, everybody. We'll see you later.